Thank you, Olga. Thank you, everybody. It, it is great and kind of weird to be in a room with so many people again, um, particularly having such a tough act to follow. Uh, I'm ben Nimmo, for those of you who don't know me, I haven't learned yet not to slap my chest when I'm wearing a mic, so apologies if you just went there. Um, I am the global lead for threat intelligence at Meta, um, formerly from the OSINT community. My background is in exposing influence operations, and now I'm at Meta, and we kind of work on all kinds of weird stuff on the internet, which, which still hasn't gone away. And good morning, I'm Eric Hutchins. I'm a security engineer investigator on our influence operations team at Meta. And like Ben, it's a delight to be here to see all of you in, in person and connect with some old friends and make some new ones. Um, and to share the stage with so many other great presenters. So thank you to the CyberWorkCon uh, for inviting us here. Uh, our team on, at Meta has a responsibility for a number of online harm types, not only covert influence operations, but also espionage, scams, and, and brigading, and many, many other types. Our responsibility is to detect, disrupt, and expose these operations. Now, when the team started this work, the first job was obviously just to, to understand what was going on and what the bad actors were doing. So it was really about analyze, break them down, and then take them down. And we started off working in these lots of different areas. Um, but what we saw increasingly was there were, the, the more we understood these threat actors, the more there were commonalities between them. There would be commonalities between different operations of the same type, but there would also be commonalities between very, very different operations. And so over the last 18 months, what we've been doing is we've come up with a framework that really allows us to break down and tabulate, analyze those commonalities across all, type, all the different types of operation that we deal with. And so it's our pleasure today to present this framework that we're using in Meta to analyze these operations. Next chart, please. So those who know me might know that I am a sucker for a good analytical framework. Uh, this morning, when uh, Jen Easterly kicked us off and was talking about 2007, one, I was angry to realize that was 15 years ago. Uh, but two, that, that is coincidentally the time frame in which my colleagues at Lockheed Martin and I were first generating the ideas around the intrusion kill chain. It was through that collaboration uh, at the time with the Air Force that sparked the ideas in the crucible of the APT era uh, for how to think differently about these compromises. And so, one, I am the the Twitter handle kill chain, but I'm also on Mastodon, so you can follow me there too, where I'm doing most of my commentating today. Uh, so after 19 years in the InfoSec world and getting a chance to work with so many brilliant people, I made the switch to thinking I'm doing something totally different in IO, uh, but you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And uh, in that fashion as well, the chance to work with so many brilliant people, many are in the audience today and here on stage with me as well. Thank you. Um, and yeah, so, so my background is, I come from the open source world. Um, my main speciality was always analyzing influence operations. I moved to Meta just under two years ago. Um, and one of the fascinating things of being an IO nerd was talking with all the different colleagues, many of whom are here. I'm sorry I can't shout you all out, but I'm a little short-sighted, so I can't actually see you. Um, but it was talking with the colleagues and saying, wait, what? Your bad guys do the same thing? And this kept on happening in more and more areas, right? Espionage, uh, fraud, scams, brigading. We were all seeing the same kind of things. And so about a year and a half ago, we started saying, right, we should be able to tabulate, tabulate this, right? Break them down and take them down. And so we started working on a kill chain. Um, Hutch joined us and, you know, the guy who got there first on the Twitter handle, I am not jealous at all. Um, but we started building up a kill chain to allow us to, to analyze all these different operations. And, we, and, and it's been fascinating to learn from so many experts in so many different fields and think, we really are all seeing the same behaviors time and again here. So, so first off, huge thanks to all the experts here who've actually made this possible. Um, next slide, please. We also have thanks to um, a gentleman who can't be here today because he's been dead for a thousand years called William the Conqueror. Um, and we will be illustrating the kill chain with the help of William the Conqueror and the Bayer Tapestry because I used to be a medievalist and some things you just can't quite shake off. Next slide. So, why are we actually here? Why are we talking? We all know, largely thanks to Hutch, there are many kill chains out there. There are many ways to understand and analyze cyber intrusion, right? There's kill chain, mitre attack, diamond model, pyramid of pain. Same thing's happening in the I.O. space. There are different kill chains out there. There are frameworks like Amit and Rich Data. There are kill chains out there for scams and frauds and account takeovers. What we don't have, as Olga said, is one chain to rule them all. We don't have one intellectual framework which is designed in the first instance to describe, analyze, and break down 
all those different sorts of operation equally. And so what we've been working on for the last 18 months is that one chain to bind them all. I will not quote too much Tolkien because then I'll be going on forever. But it is that idea of having one kill chain which we can apply equally to lots of different operations and therefore compare them speaking the same language and breaking us all out of silos. Next chart, please. And the big part of that challenge is that the operations that we see are very limited. We might align ourselves into particular teams of focusing on espionage versus I.O. The actors, of course, don't adhere to our, our terms of the rules, right? So a great example here of a blended operation is the Ghostwriter campaign an operation that uses both account takeovers and compromises, but once those accounts are, are compromised, you use them to conduct an influence operation. And so a classic intrusion kill chain might describe part of the operation, but might miss some of the aspects of the other part of the operation. Next chart, please. And taking away compromises altogether and talking about authentic accounts, another aspect that we deal with uh, uh, significantly, uh, and here we can think of the, the operation VV, which was an extremist anti-vaccination uh, group based in Italy and France. We took them down uh, last year. And so they coupled two different arm types. The first was brigade. So they were coordinating, coordinating on Telegram and, and, and organizing these mass online harassments. They were also training people on how to disrupt things like vaccination scheduling uh, systems. These accounts were also then using, uh, spreading harmful health misinformation. And so again, we have two uh, different harm types that we would deal with. No compromises here whatsoever, uh, but another example of blended types of adversaries. Next slide, please. So we designed the online operations kill chain to bridge that gap. We've designed it for any kind of operation where, if you like, there's a human at both ends of the chain. There's, there's an actor who is trying to achieve an effect, and there is some kind of human being that they are targeting. Um, and so we've, we've designed it as widely as possible, right? You can use it for, we can use it for espionage, particularly in sort of the, the, the spear phishing and social engineering side, uh, influence operations, brigading, uh, Nigerian scams, right? The good old fashioned email scam. We have designed a kill chain that it would actually be applicable to that as well. We use it at Meta to systematize and analyze our understanding and compare it across all the different teams we have dealing with different arms. But because we both believe in open source, that's where we come from, it's where our hearts are, we've designed it with the open source community in mind. Um, and as we're talking through the examples, everything we're quoting today is stuff that has been reported by open source. And it is amazing, and again, shout out to everybody here, it's amazing how much stuff you can actually see through open source. And we're trying to leverage that in the kill chain to be able to describe all the different steps that an actor will go through. It is inspired by, by Hutch, as we all are, um, and it's based on the principle that fundamentally, if you're running an online operation, doesn't matter what you're planning to do with it, some commonalities are going to apply. Like, you need to be able to get online. If you're gonna be operating on social media, you probably need social media accounts. If you're smart, you're probably gonna disguise them. Regardless of what you're then planning to do with them, there are gonna be commonalities that we can see, detect, share, describe, deal with. And so that is the basis of this approach. It's looking for those commonalities and trying to make them into a single framework. Next slide, please. And so how we use the kill chain is the same you know, mindset that we've always had. First and foremost, it's a way to organize your analysis, to break down an operation into a sequence of phases, identify detection opportunities and disruption opportunities early as possible. Second, we can use it to compare multiple operations. We can take an adversary and look at them over time and see how they've changed, see their TTP shifts over time. We can take two operations of completely different harm types and find those commonalities and realize that we can prioritize investment and disruptions and capabilities because it covers all of these operations. And third, as Ben was just pointing out, the power of being able to share. Looking back on what really took the intrusion cyber kill chain from just an idea into this incredible thing uh, beyond anybody's imagination, was that it was used as a community to share. And I think that's the really important thing that we can, across our own team, and as we're advocating across the community, be able to collaborate. Sure. And so allow us to present the 10 phases of the online operations kill chain, or the double kill chain. Uh, we'll get into each of the 10 phases uh, momentarily, 
But I also want to point out the other premise that, that remains the same, two other premises that remain the same. First, we want to be left. That's the idea, is that the earliest that we can detect and disrupt an operation, the more effect that we can have, the more friction we can throw at the adversaries. Second, as an analyst, we want to be complete as much as possible. We want to identify these, uh, as many phases of, these, uh, of, uh, of this campaign and bring in that defender mindset that anytime these adversaries are coming online, they are revealing themselves and they are revealing some of their TTPs. And to the extent that we can take everything they reveal and turn it into a countermeasure, we are most effective against them. And a brief comment about you know, 10 phases and, and the, the, the size of it. I do want to point out that the majority of the online operations that we are dealing with are meant to be seen. They are not meant to be hidden. And so there's a lot of emphasis on how these accounts and, and operations are set up to be seen. And I'll also point out that I think these phases are really important to us because these are the ones in which we see the adversaries focusing their time and their TTPs. And so that's why we're focusing on that. Next slide, please. So we're now going to talk you through the 10 phases of the kill chain, just describing briefly what you see in each one. All the examples we're going to give are come, for, come from uh, public reporting. Most of it's open source. Um, and if you think at the start, we talked about the common analysis, right? If you want to do an online operation, you've got to get online. There's only a number of ways you can do that. So the kind of things that an operation is going to need, they're going to have to start by acquiring assets. That could be getting hold of an IP address, email addresses, phone numbers. It could be if they're going to be operating on social media, social media accounts. We're applying this to a large range of operations, right? So they might be getting hold of crypto wallets. Uh, we saw a wonderful Russian operation earlier this year where they appear to have bought a whole load of beanbag chairs for their operators to slump on. And if you think our lives are hard, imagine being a troll sitting like this for 12 hours a day on your phone. It's almost like being a teenager again. Um, so most of the examples we'll be talking about are from the I.O. and, and, and the, uh, the intrusion worlds, because those are the ones we know best, those are the ones who are best documented. But always please bear in mind, we have tried to design this to be as widely applicable as possible. Uh, and to prove it, we are also going to uh, apply it to not exactly an online operation, but, but if we can have the next slide. Uh, the Norman Conquest of England in the year 1066. Believe it or not, this is a really, really good template for using the online operations kill chain. Uh, here is stage one, for example. You can see this is the Norman army acquiring all their assets before they're going on board to go and try and find England and invade it. So here we have guys with like suits of armor. They've got spears. They've got helmets. And um, if we can just click again, please. They're even bringing a barrel of wine because they're French. Next slide, please. And so now you know what it's like to work with Ben Nimmer. Uh, step two, uh, phase two of the kill chain is disguising the assets. How they are making them look real, provide that authenticity aspect of it. You now this is a really important step, as I said, because these operations are meant to be seen. Um, how they are masquerading as different organizations, how they're creating their fake personas. A lot of emphasis on this. Uh, my first experience, my first case of working in uh, an IO operation, uh, we announced earlier this year, was taking down one in Brazil. It was individuals associated with the Brazilian military who are conducting an environmentally themed uh, information operation, the first time we've encountered that. And uh, these individuals were masquerading as NGOs, uh, copying legitimate content from Greenpeace and other uh, environmental uh, entities. They were also using GAN faces. A classic TTP, the very first TTP that Ben taught me in the IO space was how to recognize a GAN face. Um, this is, and we see a cro this, uh, across uh, many harm types is a very common one still today. I do want to shout out, since I know they're both here, two people to give thanks to, uh, Luis Alonso for setting up this I.O. case for me on the silver platter, and Matt Richard, MJR, uh, former Metamate, uh, who's doing some amazing analysis on detecting the end faces, and we've been following that with uh, keen interest. So thank you both. <laughs> Next chart. And uh, my attempt uh, to be a medievalist, uh, so here's the classic camouflage, put on the armor, put on the uniform of an adversary, disguise your soldier. Did I get that right, Ben? You've got that absolutely right. And in fact, if you think about it, you know, romance scams today are still doing this. Pretend to be a soldier, get money off people. Uh, next slide, please. So the next stage in the kill chain is gathering information. This is the recon phase. Um, a more familiar term. We think about this as anything the operation is doing to get information about the environment that it's working in uh, or about the, tar the targets that it's working on. Um, there's a really good detailed description of this in the uh, 
Department of Justice indictment of the GRU operation from 2016, because this is an area where, almost by definition, lots of different people are going to have lots of little nuggets of insights. It's a very, very large jigsaw, and we all have small puzzle pieces. So this is the kind of archetype of where it's really important to be able to share what we're seeing to put together a bigger picture. For example, if you look at the, um, the GRU indictment, they were searching for their targets on social media. They were then searching for vulnerabilities in the servers that they were using. Um, they were doing a whole range of search activity to try and pinpoint not just who, but how and where and when. Lots of different platforms. And so getting information, that recon phase, is probably, I would think, the most important where if we can systematize our sharing and actually talk the same language on what we're seeing and where, that would really be a benefit to try and understand what the heck is going on. Um, back in 1066, it was a little bit easier, right? The challenges were a bit different. So if we can see the next slide, um, if you're trying to invade England, the first challenge from France is finding England. So what do you do? You want to research the environment, you climb the mast, and you look around. This is what the Normans did back in 1066, full color imagery to prove it. Next slide, please. Step four is the coordination and planning. Uh, in our field, in the IO field, the first term I learned is coordinated inauthentic behavior. Um, key term of art to describe what we're trying to identify. The inauthentic we just described about the disguise and the assets. The coordination is also key to show the, the network that there exists. And so how do these assets direct and organize themselves? Uh, in the VB case, uh, we had uh, organization along Telegram that they were using uh, to, to organize it like a, a uh, more public to get as many uh, erstwhile allies to harass uh, individuals. But of course, that coordination very much could happen in private, off-platform, places where we might not be able to see that, and where we have to might use our imagination to see what signals might apply what signals might we see? I always like to think about what it's like in those troll farms, of how they're measuring their effectiveness, uh, what's the management, how do they do the performance assessment to see whose trolls are doing the best, um, what signals that might look like when they're collecting those stats. Uh, if we look back a thousand years into uh, William's leadership style and his performance management, next chart please, uh, he is a lead from the back with a big stick yelling at people. <laughs> And just for, for the real medieval nerds in the room, which is probably me, um, if you read the Icelandic sagas, he's not known as William the Conqueror, he's known as Viljammer in Bastarvi, which means William the Bastard. Um, looking at that picture, you can probably understand why. Next slide, please. So next up, we're halfway through the kill chain, so don't panic. Um, testing defenses. A-B testing, right? If you're a sophisticated adversary, you're not just going to throw everything out there and see what happens. You're probably going to try and work out what's going to happen. So this is where all the A-B testing, all the penetration testing comes into play. This is the phase when an operation is just, I'm going to try this and this, see what happens. We know the GRU were doing this in 2016, for example. They were testing different exfiltration um, methods. They were testing access to servers. Um, but you might also see it in, in the influence operations world or in the... Um, in the harassment world, right? Post the same thing on two different platforms. Does it go down on Facebook and stay up on Telegram? Um, it's anything where you've got that, that slightly trial test phase. Um, on the next slide, again, we can see the medieval equivalent, right? Your whole army is attacking a wooden castle. Two guys run up with what look like torches on the end of, of spears. Try and set fire to the castle. Testing the defenses, see if it works. Next slide, please. Next chart, please. Step six is evading detection. So this is a dynamic action that the adversaries are doing to evade detection or sort of, sort of the visual um, uh, recognition of these campaigns as well as our, our pivots to find them. So this, think of it, this is not so much changing the, the paint scheme on the airplane or changing its tail number, but this is literally flying below the radar kind of aspect. And two examples that come to mind here going back to the VB case uh, they were constantly changing their, uh, their sort of symbi uh, symbology of using VV to using emojis to using different Unicode characters, et cetera. And so thinking about if we're just doing naive searches for keywords, we're going to miss some of that activity. You think you're finding the whole operation, you're missing some of it. That's one aspect. And credit to Graphica for reporting that, that aspect of, the, of that operation. Another example is geofencing websites. So just in September this year, we took down and announced an operation, Russian-based operation, that is making these doppelganger websites to look like German news websites. Hundreds and hundreds of these domains. Uh, Disinfo Labs pointed out that some of these domains were geofenced, that depending on where you browse them from, you would get different content. Again, if it can make you look at something and say, is this in or is this out of the campaign or the operation, that's the idea. 
when we use the term covert influence operation, I think the covertness is what really is coming into play here. Next chart. And here, the, the live to, to fight another day kind of aspect is simply to swing around and invade the backside of the castle. Fight the next day. Next slide, please. Next up, indiscriminate engagement. Originally, when we were working on this, on this kill chain, we just had engagement as a, as a pillar on its own, and it just, just got too big, right? So there's so many different ways to engage. So we divide this into two. Hutch will talk about targeted engagement, but before that, you get indiscriminate engagement. That's the classic, just throw it at the wall and make, see if it sticks. Um, a lot of spam campaigns tend to do this. It's generally the less sophisticated end of the spectrum. But this is anything where you're throwing out content and just hoping that somebody will pick up on it. Spamouflage, um, that wonderful Chinese network of which is like, frankly, it's a gift to investigators. When you feel you can't find anything else at all, you can still find Spamouflage. It's really relief. Um, but Spamouflage does this a lot, right? They'll post stuff on three different platforms, no hashtags, no kind of attempt to engage people, and then they use fake accounts to like, make it look like people are engaging. Um, operation Secondary Infection, which is the Russian operation that was planting forgeries all over the internet did the same thing, right? They'd create a forgery in Swedish about the Swedish prime minister. They drop it on a forum for the Pakistani civil service in Islamabad, and they'd leave it there. Like, how are you expecting people to pick up on that? Um, in the case of 1066, if we can see the next slide, look at these archers here. They're not even aiming, right? This guy on the left, he's going to shoot his own man in the back. It's just, don't even point and shoot. Just, just like point it or wave it around and then let go. That is the indiscriminate engagement side. Very unsophisticated. By contrast, we have the targeted engagement. So coming again from the InfoSec intrusions world, this one very much you know, feels familiar to, uh, to us in terms of how individuals can be targeted. I think we can think about this also not only in a one-to-one -one situation of one actor, you know, one operation targeting one individual, but we can also think of, uh, of a one-to-many. So the, the Z team that we've been alluded to earlier uh, would comment on on German politician Facebook pages and Twitter pages with their Z iconography and anti zelensky messages. It was targeted to a specific audience, but it was, it was vast in terms of the audience. Let's also think, though, about the many to one, and that's where the brigading comes into play. That online harassment of getting many people to flood uh, vile comments and things to one individual is a really important part of targeted engagement. I also want to take the opportunity to remind all of us here in this room that we are not only just reporters and researchers of this activity, we may well be a target sometime. And I think it's very important to keep in mind, um, whether it's a journalist being on the receiving end of an influence campaign trying to launder sort of that influence through a legitimate media, or as our friends at Google pointed out a few years ago, of North Korean actors infiltrating vulnerability research communities. So I think it's very important to remember we're not just in an ivory tower uh, researchers, but may well be targets of this from time to time too. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, and so while we're at uh, step eight of 10 of our kill chain, uh, this is the end of the kill chain for poor King Harold um, and his targeted engagement. Okay. Next slide, please. So we're nearly there. Nine out of 10 is compromising assets. For, for the cyber intrusion part, this is when it gets really serious, right? To take over assets that the target is using. A lot of this will fall into the cyberspace. So if you think about using malware, using social engineering, phishing, trying to get hold of somebody's account credentials. Um, but you, you might also see this in the influence operation space or in brigading, right? If you socially engineer somebody to give you access, if the threat actor does it, to get access to somebody else's social media account or website and then locks out the original owner, changes the password, that is the same kind of thing. Compromising assets is getting anything that an operation does to get the keys to somebody else's treasure chest. Um, which is an apposite phrase, not that I was planning that for ages, because if we have the next slide, this is one of my favorite images from the Bayer Tapestry. How do you surrender a castle? You put the keys on a spear, wave it over the wall, and you wait for the other guy to pick it up. Compromising assets in 1066. Next slide. Key management. It always comes down to key management. <laughs> yep. And then finally, we have enabling persistence. Uh, this is uh, when, the, when the adversary first encounters disruption. What do they do to respond to that? Uh, you know, no, no good plan uh, can respond uh, to uh, its first encounter with the enemy. This is the operation's first encounter with us as defenders. So what do they do to, to, to last? The, uh, the Russian operation with the German news websites I mentioned, they just keep cranking these websites out. So they're running the same playbook over and over again and, and trying to make us find them the, the most durable way to block them. Looking back on the, on the GRU activity, I think there's some really interesting examples 
One is the persona Alice Donovan, which was being used as an author to, to publish uh, various uh, content uh, and which switched to Hillary themed content just before the election. And uh, what happened was once that operation was revealed, they removed the byline from the, op from the pages. So then the content kind of remains the same, uh, but maybe the linkage to connect it to the operation uh, is gone. That's the idea for how they could do this. And of course, the other key thing is moving to different platforms altogether which next chart would be our view of an ideal day when we do such a good job of disrupting it, they all flood to Telegram to do it over there instead. Yeah. Next chart. So there you have it, the online operations kill chain. And some caveats, again, coming from the experience of, of uh, these types of mindsets and sharing these types of frameworks over the years. First and foremost, it is modular. Not all operations are going to use all phases in the same way. You're going to have a mix and match, and that's okay. Uh, I often use the phrase, uh, the quotation, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And the idea is to be useful. Uh, and when it's not useful, we have to change. Second, and then this is what really convinced me that this was the right kind of approach, is that these operations that we're dealing with are focused at a human-to-human -human level. We're not looking so much at the exploits of a browser or an email server or the behaviors of a malware uh, implant, but rather on the behaviors of people, both on the targeting side as well as on the receiving side of an operation. And then, as we mentioned from the outset, on our team we deal with a whole variety of harm types. And while certain uh, frameworks will be more precise with given harm types and within that one domain, we see so much blending and overlaps across our organization that having the generality and that commonality has been really important to identify uh, opportunities where we can share both analytical tradecraft as well as build uh, better detections. Sure, please. But I used to be a journalist and the qu question for a journalist is always, so what? As Hutch said, we design this to be useful and there's a couple of ways that we can see this being useful both internally and externally. Internally, it allows us to compare lots of different sorts of operation according to a common language and a common framework. So let's imagine, for example, that you're an organization which has three different teams focused on espionage, I.O., and scams and frauds. If each of those is using a different framework, maybe three different kill chains, or one's using MITRE ATT&CK, one's using a kill chain, one's using something else, what happens if threat actors are all doing the same thing? Let's say they're all downloading faces from this person does not exist, which is what I did for this slide. What are the chances that they're actually going to sit down and say, hey, we're all saying the same thing, and that's disguising assets, that the second link out of 10 in the kill chain, that's a really early phase. Maybe we should be working together actually to detect this and disrupt it. Whereas if they're all using the same framework, it's going to be much easier to compare notes and say, across all these different violation types, bad actors are doing the same thing, so maybe we should be getting ahead of them. So that's the internal use. And then, next slide, please. Externally, this is a screenshot from one of my favorite operations ever, which is secondary infection. Uh, Russian operation planted fakes all across the internet, tried to interfere in the UK general election in 2019. S the exposure of secondary infection is all about sharing. There's folks here from DFR Lab, there's Adam Ronsley's here, I know the Graphica team are here, um, the guys from Meta who originally discovered this damn thing are here. The way secondary infection got exposed Facebook found 16 accounts. They shared it with DFR Lab. DFR Lab built it out to about 200 accounts over 40 different platforms. They shared that with the platforms. Graphica went further, found about 2,500 accounts on 326 different platforms. Shared information. Reddit found the same stuff, shared it back. This was all about info sharing. I remember being at the heart of that. We had calls with like 20 different teams. Every team had its own way of understanding. They had their own questions, and it took a while to work out, hang on, you're asking the same thing as the question that a guy got asked yesterday, you're just using completely different words. If we had had a single framework that we all recognized to be able to say, here's how we break down this operation, here's how they're creating their single-use burner accounts, it would have been so much easier to just share information and let everybody know, here's what we're seeing, and it would have made it easier to share back. Next slide, please. And ending where we started, same mindset. Identify the complete phases of the kill chain, understand opportunities to detect and disrupt at the earliest as possible. Use it as a framework to measure your effectiveness of moving earlier in the kill chain. Identifying those commonalities of seeing GAN phases across the entire organization, training the entire team, building new detections to find them and disrupt them ourselves. And then share as a community, provide that context um, and uh, 
and the, 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 the means of which to use the same language to share and put together those pieces together. Yeah. It's been an honor, thank you very much, and if we have time, we'd love to take a question or two. Yeah. Awesome, thank you for the uh, presentation. I was just curious if there's anywhere we can read like a white paper on this specific kill chain. Yep, we're working on a paper on this. Thanks. If we can quote you to like the internal teams to say, hey, there's interest for this <laughs> externally, that would make lives a lot smoother. Yes. Recognizing that this is ultimately uh, an information sharing kill chain intent, I was wondering if you could tell us any steps that you're taking to socialize this new kill chain, not only amongst threat intelligence teams, but also with executives who will be then trying to uh, put forward the idea of this boosting the information sharing, not only within the tactical level, but also at the strategic level. So any any information on the socialization of Terry, with, with what was the, the other audience that you mentioned? So you have, how are you socializing this, not only among CTI teams, but also executives? And I was wondering if you could speak to that. Well, I'll say from his, historically, that was a crucial aspect for the intrusion kill chain was that we did at Lockheed Martin use it to guide the executive notification scheme that further down the kill chain you did notify increasing higher uh, executives. So from that standpoint, I think from a decision making aspect, it is very much in there. We're using it, one, we talked about prioritizing investment for detections. That's one way in which we're looking to, at an organizational level, say, this is what we gotta focus on because here's all the things that's going to detect. Um, and then secondly, we do very much measure how much we share with our partners and how much we are relying our detections from leads from our trusted communities, both amongst the big tech companies, but also from researchers, open source, and, and, and other communities as well. So being able to measure that sharing community is another key metric that we use internally. Um, thanks very much for what seems like a very clear explanation of the model. I'm curious, it seems like part of this isn't simply descriptive, but also anticipatory. Um, the last example you had was a bunch of stuff being shown across a number of different items, but I'm curious if you've had any examples of a tactic or a movement between stages that you've only seen for, let's say, fraud or espionage, but that has anticipated something that then gets seen across one of the other items. So, so the way we're thinking about this is um, initially this, this, is, this is a post hoc system, right? You, you, you have to have the operation before you can break it down, before you can understand what it's doing. Um, but the way we're thinking of it is when, once you can identify what the, the threat actors are doing in one area, you can actually start to look ahead and say, okay, well, if they're doing that here, then we want to be building detection here, here, and here to get ahead of them the next time they're doing that. Um, a really interesting example is actually, again, you know, GAN faces, and shout out to MJR here, that, that I, from off the top of my head, late December 20, late 2019 was the first time we saw an influence operation that was using a lot of faces uh, created by StyleGAN2. And at that point, those of us who were at Graphica and DFR Lab spent just days looking at these, at these profile pics until our eyeballs watered. But there was no kind of scale detection going on. But what happened was then the whole community started working on this. I mean, sh again, shout out to MJR, shout out to some of the early OSINT specialists who are doing this, and working out just by eyeball, what are the ways that you can identify these? And then increasingly what we'll see is folks are gonna build scale detection which allows you to do that. And so it goes from this individual detection through to working out, okay, that is how we can identify this. And once you can, once, once you can systematize your identification of it, then you can move on to the, to the anticipatory model and the more we can share information about that, the more we can do it anywhere in the system, right? So GAN faces came into the public eye through influence operations, but a GAN face is a GAN face. It doesn't matter what the threat actor is going to be doing with it. If you can detect that thing, you can apply it to any of the threat spaces we're working on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.